Got it. 38-27, Kansas beats BYU. Not the end of the world. The Cougars can win Friday, and if they do, they'll be 4-1. and one. Coming out of September in their first year as a P5, and that's, that's pretty good. That's about as good as anyone could hope for, and we're right there knocking on the door. Jayhawks scored 21 points off three BYU turnovers, 14 directly. I wrote an article in the Deseret News. You can find it at Deseret.com about how sometimes – Charity does faileth. Yes, it does. And they got to get selfish Friday night. But they also got to do, Blaine, is they got to run the football. Yeah, 20, 22 rushes for nine yards. They average 0. 0.4 yards, if you're doing the math at home, per carry. And, and, and it hurt that they didn't run the ball well early. Um, and, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit on AFR. If you just watched AFR uh, with Dave Nixon and I and Dave, we talked about running a little bit. There, there's many times in a game when you, you know, you want, I think BYU needs to run for four yards a carry or more. I don't care if they get 150 yards a game. I don't care if they get 70 or 80. I feel like when they do run over the course of the game, they need to average four yards a carry. Not point four yards a carry. No. As, as Trevor Maddich said on Sports Nation Monday, um, they're averaging two. And then he goes, and I'm not talking about two yards. I'm talking about two feet they averaged in that last game, which is, which is really discouraging. He's he commented on that show that he thought maybe it wasn't fixable this year. Yeah, what do you think and, about and that? that? Have to go, I, I think he's a little more pessimistic than I am. I mean, I here's think, a guy who was your center. Yep. He he had to run block and pass block. He's had it with this group. Yeah, he's uh, he's given up earlier than I am, uh, and and I don't know that this is the week to fix it. And we're going to get into Cincinnati a little bit, but their defensive front. Um, especially with you call him the Godfather Corleone, Don, Dante Corleone. Yeah, but 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 Corleone is a a, a forced to be reckoned with along with Briggs. They, they have two NFL caliber defensive linemen on the Cincinnati. We'll get into the whole thing with them. I don't know if this is the week that you fix the running game. I think you can make improvements in it. Some of it I think you can fix with scheme. You have to adapt the scheme to the talent you have up front. Um, seems like they have a lot of unblocked players. Um, hey, you want to know what? If guys are missing blocks and they're missing assignments and you've got somebody behind them that maybe isn't quite as talented, uh, but they get their assignment right, you got, you got to play the person that does what they're supposed to do, in my opinion. So so we're, you know, I think there's some things that they can do. I think scheme can help. I also think that early in the game, and this is backward to what pump, some people think, but I hate to go back to the, what we used to do, but but guess what? Back back in the late seventies and and eighties through through the the mid eighties, we didn't worry about establishing the run early in a game. We established the pass, and we had the the quick throw game as an extension of a run game. So we'd throw a bunch of quick screens, a screen out to the left. You make the whole offensive line and defensive line run to the sideline. And then you screen over to the right, and then they run over to that sideline. Then you run a center screen where you let them rush all the way up the field, and you get rid of it right before they get there. Pretty soon, these guys, these big defensive linemen, Corleone, who's 330 pounds, been running sideline to sideline, play after play after play. And now now you run it at him, and guess what? He doesn't have much left in the tank to go chase your running back. And so there's our, there are ways you can use the pass game to set up your run game, and, and I think they need to think really creatively about how they do that because they're just not knocking people off the ball right now. BYU Sports Attic with us from Farmington, Utah. Lancy Boo Boo jumping in from South Salt Lake. Good to have you here. Uh, David's in from the Tri-Cities, Washington State, and um, everybody, the whole world. Comes to wise Does somebody's guys. handle outside the echo chamber? I like that. Outside the echo chamber. That is cool. Uh, at BYU Statsman tweeted, through four games, the Cougars have 244 yards rushing, which is the fourth fewest rushing yards by a BYU team to start a season since at least 1956 and the worst since 2004. They're working on that. The linemen are bugged. They're yeah. going to work it all week. They're going to try to run the football Friday night. Yeah, I, I think they will. And like I said, I don't know that this is the week that you fix it all. And to me, it's not about, hey, you know what? We have a yardage goal. We're going to get 125 yards rushing. I don't think that needs to be the goal. Just get enough. Get, just get four yards of carry and take what the defense gives. If they load the box with eight people, throw it. 
But ma- but throw it and make them back off and then run it. And when you do run it, be effective. Draws and those types of things to take advantage, misdirection to take advantage of aggressive Ds like Kansas and, and average four yards of carry. And if you carry it 20 times, to- if you throw it 50 and you run it 20 in a 70-play day, BYU had 72 plays this last week, a 70-play day, I'm, o- I'm okay with 80 yards rushing on 20 carries. What I'm not okay with is nine it's just no, no, no. And, and points and point zero four, four per rush. Outside the echo chamber, we're going to deal with injuries uh, and answer your question here in a moment. Love Keaton Slovis. He, he's such a good guy off the field, on the field. He threw for 357 yards, two touchdowns. His pick six was a deflected ball. He threw behind Isaac, mm-hmm. but Isaac tipped it up into the air, and and the Kansas was there and ran it in for a touchdown. No running game, but Slovis threw for 357. Um, has a chance to get BYU through the first five games at 4-1 and one with a win on Friday night. Uh, he's not a runner, okay? He's not Jaron Hall. He's not Zach Wilson. He's not Taysom Hill. But as Kalani has said and Aaron Roderick has said, he can sling it. And uh, if it comes to it that BYU's not going to be able to run all season, which is, which is really, really not a good thing, Slovis can toss it around all season. Yeah. And remember, Slovis played in an offense at USC – uh, his first couple of years where they didn't worry about throwing it 50 times a game. No. You know, he was in that in kind of an air raid type setup, a, a spread offense where he was just throwing it every down. He's completely comfortable doing that. But j- just like I, we were talking about at USC, they had such good talent at wide receiver that they got the ball quickly out in space to those Throw slot screens. Yeah. Bunch of screens. Just let yeah. them go. Throw 10 screens in the first half this week. Make Cincinnati chase the football all over the field. Spread that defense out. Wear them down at elevation. And then guess what? In the, in the second half of the third quarter, in the fourth quarter, if you got the lead and you need to run the ball, you probably are going to have a tired front seven that you are able to push around a little bit. And then you average seven or eight yards of carry, and the 2.5 you had in the first two quarters doesn't matter because at the end of the game you average four or 4.5. Remember at the Arkansas game, in that fourth quarter, Arkansas was tired on both sides of the ball. And mm-hmm. BYU got pressure with three guys or four yeah. guys on the defensive line. And on the offensive line, they did just enough with running, didn't do a lot of running, but did just enough where play action worked. And you think about Keaton Slovis' game-winning touchdown pass to Chase Roberts in the corner. That's because Arkansas had to worry about LJ coming out of the backfield. Right. And so they, they complement one another. There's some things you can do to help with that. And I know that BYU's thinking, you know, coaching staff's thinking schematically, what do we do differently? How do we approach play calling a little bit differently? And, you know, and on the defensive side of the ball um, – give you a little bit of hope here after breaking down the film and, and looking through it. Um, the, the word is that the, the bigger run plays that they got, and remember Kansas uh, averaged six yards a rush. They, they had 37 rushing plays. They threw the ball 19 times and they ran at 37. So they're a little unbalanced the mm-hmm. other way. Um, they only had 130 yards passing. That's 150 yards below their average. But, and they ran for 221. Everybody's like, oh, my gosh. Well, guess what? They averaged 217. Yeah. So they're slightly above their average running the ball. They were extremely below. That for, I, If you don't turn the ball over three times, as miserable as BYU was running the football, holding Kansas to 352 yards a game when they were averaging 500 yards of offense and controlling their pass game, that's enough to win. But, but BYU was very disappointed especially in the second half and their ability to stop the run. And it wasn't about guys getting pushed around. It was bad run fits. And we're going to talk about that in our pregame show on yeah. Saturday. Dave Nixon Friday. and I are, Yeah, on Friday. Friday. That's right. Um, it's about guys understanding the concepts and then being in the right gap that they're supposed to be in. And most of the big run plays that Kansas got were mistakes. So those are fixable, right? And Kansas is hard to defend. Not very many teams can run the number of schemes that Kansas runs and be effective at all of them. Think about this. In that game, you saw Kansas run open option. You saw them run um, uh, read option. You saw them run zone read. You saw them run run pass option. You saw them run direct quarterback run. You, You saw them run power. You saw them run counter. And then they had a fairly sophisticated pass game. Teams don't like no. – that's a hard team to scout. But you know when you do that? You do that when you have a veteran quarterback and 10 returning starters on offense. And they had that, and they played well, and I'm curious to see how they play against yeah, Texas Yeah, it'll be interesting because Texas is so talented. Now, Cincinnati this week, um, they have two returning starters on offense. 
And one of them is not the quarterback. That's, That's a, a transfer. Different. A Their receivers different. are all transfers. Their quarterbacks are transfer. They're they're very skilled, and they're talented, but they don't run seven completely different schemes that you've got to defend. I expect BYU to be much better on defense from an assi- assignment um, uh, situation where they're going to be where they're supposed to be. Keep in mind, Cincinnati's numbers offensively are very similar. They run yeah. it for over 200 yards a game. They like to run the ball. They throw it for over 200 yards a game. They're balanced. They just don't run as many different things to defend. So I think BYU should look smarter out there because there's less to prepare I'm for. I'm excited. I'm excited for the game. And David... Uh, Said, hey, not to change the topic too much, but congrats to the Lady Cougs beating Texas in soccer. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit, so hang with us. Uh, and you can interrupt our thoughts anytime you want. Absolutely. That doesn't mean we're going to start talking about soccer, but we're going to tell you when we're going to start talking about soccer. That's right. What a, Cougar Nation, what do you think of Darius Lassiter? The transfer comes in. He's starting to get more looks. Had eight catches for 84 yards, caught a touchdown at Kansas on Saturday. He is now, you know, with Cody Epps still out with a hamstring and Keanu Hill not right yet, but he's trying to play. Uh, Lassiter has certainly gotten on uh, Keaton Slovis' radar. Mm -hmm. Big target at 6'3". I think we're going to see more and more of him. And the thing about Lassiter is the word out is he's smart. And to play in this offense, not only do you need to be skilled, you need to be able to... Not only know what you run when you break the huddle with the play that's called, but also know when the quarterback changes the play, what your route changes to, or when the cover yeah. changes, how you adjust your route. Darius is picking up this offense pretty quickly, and uh, and you see it in his production. He's another big receiver at 6'3", and I, I really like his progress. Doesn't he just seem like he's getting better every single game, and he's earning the trust of Keaton Slovis? So, Absolutely. And now imagine, and who knows when this is going to be, but you get that hamstring feeling healthy. Cody Epps comes back, and he's playing. Keanu feels 100% healthy. Darius has now developed. And and you know who made a, a little bit of a improvement this last week too is Keelan Marion right he's a little bit behind Laster in in terms of grasping the offense but but he's he's not far behind and when it's all said and done this is a deep receiver group Chase Roberts has been playing really well and consistently all season Isaac Rex has been lights out at tight end it's a good group and if you have to throw the ball 50 times a game, I like that group. <laughs> Mike, just me, said the Lassiter story with his family was one of the better stories of the weekend, for sure. Amber says he really likes Darius. Great potential. I, I sat down with Chase Roberts. He's going to be our f- feature uh, Friday night on game day. And I uh, had a great conversation with Chase. He's playing well. But you know what we're going to talk about on Friday is uh, I said, Chase, what do you want all of your peers, all of our college football, to know about serving a mission and and what it means to try to come back and play division one football after you've taken two years off because we hear coaches all the time go well they're older more mature they're this they're, they're that as if there's a competitive advantage i asked him point blank what advantage athletically did you get by serving two years in canada and you'll hear his answer and some of his thoughts that i thought he represented very well of like um hey it is, uh, they're not mission trips, they're not vacations. And, and one thing that I'll tease you with on that is he said that uh, in many ways, missions are harder than college football. There you go. And so we're going to tackle that on Friday night. Well, 65 kids on the Cougar team are returned missionaries who've done that. And Chase Roberts is, 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 has NFL potential. Um, he's just a sophomore. He's BYU's best receiver. And, um, and he, of course, he had the one-hander against Arkansas. Look for that Friday night. I think he represents the school and the faith uh, very well in a topic that's always tossed around when BYU comes yeah, there, to play. There was a comment again on, on uh, game day, college game day, on ESPN about BYU's age again. Well, yeah, it was from that comedian. Yeah, he's like, I'm going to go with Fon. BYU because, well, I can't even remember what he, he said. He said they're old enough to get a reverse mortgage. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Half the teams got reverse mortgages. That's how old they are. So look for that so. on Friday. Um, BYU was up 17-14 on the road in the Big 12 at halftime. They had that, a chance to win that game. That's after they gave up a scoop and score. Scoop and score. And uh, the, 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 curi- the concern is the injuries started to pile up a little bit in the second half. So we're going to roll down the guys who were out, and then, yeah. uh, and well, then I got well, a question for you. May- 
Yeah, maybe out. Well, no, yeah, but you're we're right. out in the game. They at least well, went out at we some point. We don't know the final on the first one, so we'll talk about that a little bit. So Ben Bywater went out with a shoulder, um, and I think the MRI was today. So we don't. Yeah, know we that. don't know on Ben. So uh, uh, Parker Kingston, he got knocked into next week on that fumble on his first carry, um, but he's been cleared. I just don't know if he's going to practice yeah, leading the up to the is, game. So remember, I mean, we, yeah, that's we what thought, we think. We thought that. Uh, was it Wakely or Wall that got knocked a little silly the Wait, week before? I thought before? it was Wakely. And we thought there's no way he'll come back, and he was cleared and played. Yeah. And so the first two we don't know. Kingsley Suamata'ia, he went out, and then he came back. Yeah, everybody so he's forgot good. he played the last series. He's good to go. Waylon Lapuahu, he went out. Might not see him yeah, this he week. Yeah, he had an elbow issue, and we, we may, not, may not see him this week. Cody, <laughs> Cody's just... Cody Epps. Who knows with Cody Epps? It's been a nagging hamstring problem that's bothered him since all through camp, and it's just... Not where he can feel like he can go full speed. So we'll see on Cody Epps, but that's been a big, yeah, a big detriment to BYU's. A little offense. frustrating, but yeah. uh, no one more frustrated than than Epps. Uh, Aiden Robbins uh, didn't make the trip. He's he's home dealing with an injury that that might keep him out for a little while longer. But it's a legit injury. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, sometimes with BYU, you know, they don't talk about injuries that aren't. Um, season ending. Yeah. So if somebody has a season ending injury, they just come up and they just say, hey, like, like I'm trying to think of who's out for the year. Oh, Hinkley Rapati. Right. You know, like out for the year with this, right? And, and they just give it to you. If it's not season ending, they just go, we don't talk about them if they're not season ending. I wish they would because it it's a part, little bit of a disservice. Part, part of it is, um, and Dave Nixon was saying, well, here's the part I get. We were talking to him today. He goes, right. what if you have a rib injury? What if you have broken ribs? And you're going to come back from that. And you're just going to say, hey, he has a nagging injury. Because you come back, and the other team knows that you're coming back from broken ribs. They're going to hit you in the ribs. Sure. And so he says some, some of it makes sense to keep it quiet. So we get that, right? Yeah. Um, uh, but the, the ones that we just talked about, those are n- none of those have, at least to this point, a season-ending injury. And, and here's what we can say about Aiden Robbins. He did not lose his job to freshman L.J. Martin. Right. He's injured and can't play. And L.J. Martin's the next best, best option. But Robbins is 6'3", 235, ran for 1,000 yards last year. When healthy, BYU can't wait to get him back. Right. And there was a, there was a little bit of a, what, what's the word, Mis, misinformation out there? And it's not misinformation. BYU just didn't just provide any. It's a lack any. of information. And so the lack of information got everybody like, whoa, the freshman beat out the 1,000-yard rusher. The 1,000-yard rusher got hurt, tried to go, couldn't. They sat him down to get him healthy, and, and so LJ's had to play. Now, LJ is a great young talent, but they need both of those guys. Yeah. And 100% Aiden Robbins uh, down the stretch is going to be needed in this offense. All right, here's a question, two questions. Oh, and did you mention Talon Alfrey? Oh, we'll get Alfrey. Okay. John uh, Crowder is asking, do we think that that was a targeting hit on Parker Kingston? Nope. Uh, no, we do not. Not even close. It was just a well, football pro- hit that was probably, wicked. It probably last year would have drawn a flag. And but they you notice re- they're not throwing as many They, they would have re- they're, they're not being so aggressive, and they yeah. can call it down from the booth, right? Yeah. And say, hey, we need to take a look at that this. That was a shoulder. It was he, wicked. He, he led with his shoulder, and, and we didn't show it on AFR. I was thinking maybe we should have. When a ball carrier has the ball, and you make an effort to lead with your shoulder, ball carriers many times will lower their head instinctively at contact. So they lower like this. If you go back and watch that in slow motion, the defender comes in with his left shoulder and forearm, and do their heads collide? They, they might. But you're going to notice that Parker's reaction as he's getting hit, he lowers the front of his head down a little bit. So even had their heads collided, it's different than if he's a receiver going across and he's defenseless and, they, and, and there's head-to-head contact. Running backs lower their shoulder, and with that, lower their head. There's lots of helmet-to-helmet contact yeah. um, that, that's not targeting. I, I, as I've looked at it multiple times, I feel like he came up so quick that LJ didn't block him. He beat the block to the spot. Yeah. Parker was unexpected. The last second, Parker ducked his head just a little bit. The, the defender, and it was Dotson, led with his shoulder and his arm, and that kind of collapsed up. Did their helmets touch? They might have. Yeah. But it, it does not meet the definition of targeting. It was a very good defensive football play. All right, before we get to Talon, Alfred, an update there. Uh, Defy Logic Tech sent us in this question that, uh, that I'm going to ask you. 
Uh, isn't it interesting that Aiden Robbins is a downhill runner, capitalized? Isn't it interesting that A-Rod designed a zone-blocking scheme early on which wouldn't fit Aiden Robbins' running style? And Robbins was the starter to begin the season. Isn't it interesting that Robbins has only had 10 touches in three games? I'm happy with what BYU's accomplished, but I'm not happy that we're having the same problems as we did last year in the running game. What's the term about doing the same thing over and over again and getting the same results? Yeah, that's the definition of, of insanity. insanity. Um, we've, we've all noticed that. Chris Brooks, by the way, who struggled in the BYU run game for a lot last year, ran free for the Miami Dolphins on Sunday. Uh, sometimes talent and scheme are different from one another, but Aiden Robbins is hurt and got hurt early, and that's why he only has 10 carries. But downhill runners got like, like, like uh, Chris Brooks and Aiden got to run downhill. Right. I think Aiden is better. Like, his skill set is better um, when BYU or when anybody that would utilize his skill get him – whether it's lining up next to the quarterback and running at the line of scrimmage or getting him in the pistol where he lines up behind the quarterback, especially in short yardage, or getting the quarterback under center, which BYU doesn't do a ton, and turning and handing it downhill, he's better with his shoulders and his hips starting square to the line of scrimmage and running toward the line of scrimmage. Then when he's having to cut to the cutback lane, putting his foot in the ground and cutting back on an angle or bouncing it, um, he sees better that way. You can just see it from his highlight film. Um or when he gets it, you know, on an angle off tackle, but with his hips and his shoulders going toward the tackle or the, or, or the tight end. And from a blocking perspective, he sees blocks better when they're down blocks and a, and a puller that's kicking somebody out and he cuts up inside the, the, the trap block. Yeah. Or when they're running counter where they bring a guard and a tackle. Typically when they do that, they pull a guard and a tackle. The guard kicks out and the tackle leads up. He's really good when he gets up in behind that tackle and then reads that block. Cuts inside yeah. the guard and reads that block or cuts back if they overplay the backside. He seems to have better vision that way than when he's running parallel to the line of scrimmage on, on like, let's say, an outside zone where, where the object in the outside zone is to spread that defense out um, and create these... A vertical gaps in the defense. You, somebody chooses one side, another chooses another, it creates a gap. Tyler Algier phenomenal in that like Tyler Algier's vision and his ability to put his foot in the ground and accelerate quickly and hit that hole and break tackles off the charts right yeah and so here's the good news BYU has they have counters and powers and they they run outside zone they run inside zone too I like it when, and even inside zone is a little bit more downhill remember the first half of the Arkansas game when, when Kingsley came and pulled, they pulled Lapuahu and Kingsley. Lapuahu kicked out. Kingsley kicked out. LJ ran up inside. They, they, they do have that in their arsenal. It's not like BYU only runs outside stretch zone. They have all of that in their arsenal, um, and they need to do a, a better job of, of tailoring the play calling to the back that they have in the game and take advantage of their skills. Bell by DeVoe says, sorry I'm late. Uh, for, you're forgiven. Any update on Bywater's shoulder? Uh, we talked about that a moment ago. No, we do not. And, they, and, and Bell Bidville is also asking if Bywater can go, is Glasker next up? Glasker's one of the guys next up. but at The that Oregon in, transfer. At that inside, it's Taggart. Taggart, yeah. Um, the Oregon transfer. And by the way, Taggart's been playing better and better every week. And so um, he was earning some playing time anyhow. Um, you know, he played last week when Ben went out. But but Taggart has, as he's grasped this defense after transferring down, um, he's been more and more impressive all the time. He's going to be a very good player. And so if Ben couldn't play, you'll see Taggart get some playing time. Glasker also gets some playing time because they'll rotate. They can take A.J., and they can slide him inside, and they can play Glasgow on the outside. Um, and then, of course, Max, who's been playing solid all year, uh, Thule is also there. So, um they're, they're pretty good. And then the next guy, if we're going to go six deep, would be Kafusi, ace. Yeah. So Let's hope um, we don't go six deep. Yeah. But, but I'm telling you, um, Taggart's solid. He can play, and so can Glasker. Yeah. And, and Kafusi's just young and light. He's going to be a phenomenal player. Reminds me of Alani Fua. We'll take Alani Fua at linebacker all day long, yes, right? Yes, we will. So BYU's fairly deep. Now, let's keep in mind that Bywater – He's this team defensive leader. Yeah. Um, 
He makes a bunch of play calls. Gotta have He's him. fierce. He's two years in a row the leading tackler on this team. Like, let's hope that this MRI is is negative or that it's minor and they can strap it up and have him play because he. he I don't care who you put in there. there there's a drop off. Hope so. Hey, Richard uh, says, "Hey, just started to listen when my wife called me." Uh, for dinner, back now listening from Panama. Okay, so Panama, we're good to have where you Panama with us. was. We're glad Richard's we're going to listen to Kalani Sataki. Before we do, Talon Alfrey is the center who, or the safety who started all last season, but he got hurt during camp. He's due back against TCU, which is in a couple of weeks. Remember, it's Cincinnati, then a bye week, then TCU. That's right. a huge gain for the defense. Oh, yeah. And here, in this defense, in Jay, Jay Hill's defense, it's fairly easy to put a new guy in at corner or on the D line because the assignments are fairly simple and consistent regardless of the call. Um, uh, and they can just kind of get after it. They ask a lot out of the, out of the inside backers and out of the safeties in terms of recognition of formations, play callings, checks, all that kind of stuff. So it's way harder to play at safety without experience. Remember, Talon started a good portion of last season. Like, he's a veteran guy. He understands this defense. Not only is he really physical in the run game and, and understand the pass defense, he he's also um, really smart. And so to get Talon back would be a, a huge deal. Um, and it'll, it'll really help them with depth, depth at that safety position. Because remember, they lost... Before the season even started, they lost Micah Harper, Micah and Talon, who were both that were those were the starting two, were Talon and Micah, and they lost them both before the first game. So getting one of those two back would be huge, and all along we've been told behind the scenes, look for him the week after the bye. All right, let's listen to Kalani Sataki. Here's his comments to kick off the week, and then Spencer Linton will join us on the other side of the head coach. DJ, will you roll that? Okay, well, uh, new week, so heading to a uh, game, uh, you know, <laughs> looking at the, the game five now and, and um, uh, right in the middle of conference play now. Uh, actually, you know, had a really, other than the loss, good experience in Kansas. I thought that was a good game. Uh, I'm proud of the guys. I'm proud of some of the things that we did. Obviously, uh, some errors to correct and, and get ourselves a better position to have more success this week. Uh, I'm going against uh, Cincinnati, really uh, athletic, well-coached team. I mean, you look at uh, their head coach, uh, Scott Satterfield. Obviously, he's been a head coach longer than I have and has done some really good things at Appalachian State and did some great things at Louisville, too. So uh, he has a great staff. I know their, their defensive coordinators, uh, he, he's, he's got a great reputation for what he does with defense and offense. Obviously, they're, 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 they're well-coached on, on all three phases, but um, looking forward to having them at home. Um, for our, for our Big 12 home opener, and, um, and you know, it, coming off a loss, it, it it actually helps to get get on the field a day earlier. So we're excited for this game, being at home, and then getting it, the game on Friday. Looking forward to the matchup. There's great players on on uh, on Cincinnati's team. We have tons of respect for their their program, and and especially those players that have seen a lot of success in their time. So uh, quality players all over the place, and. Uh, again, I probably say this every week, especially in this conference. We love being in this conference. Uh, even after the first uh, game not going our way, we, we we enjoy being part of it. We're looking forward to having a lot more to play for this season, and uh, looking forward to you know the partnership that we have with all these these teams in the conference and uh, bringing uh, Cincinnati to our home is going to be a lot of fun for us. And looking forward to the crowd uh, being being a you know a, a advantage for us and. Uh, we're looking forward to this to this matchup. So I'll take any questions you guys may have. Head coach Kalani Sataki setting the theme uh, tone for the week. Here's one thing he does like. Uh, red zone scoring. BYU is 15 for 15. That means inside the 20, they've scored every time, including 12 touchdowns. The only schools in college football that are doing better than BYU in the red zone, Wisconsin's 18 for 18, and Florida State 17 for 17, and then there's BYU 15 for 15. Yeah, and in terms of percentage, they're tied for first in the country. Um, so we'll say this. They've been very reliable, and their touchdown percentage is outstanding. Right, that's a yeah. great percentage of the times you get down that red zone scoring touchdowns. They need to get there a little bit more, um, but but that you know that's absolutely a good sign. Um, and again, we we can go back to this. There's a lot of things you'd like to do better in that game. You'd like to run the football better. You'd like to defend the run run the, a little bit better than they did in that game. 
But the bottom line is you cannot turn the ball over no. for, to get 21 points off of turnovers <coughs> and win a football game. You just can't do it. 